Hey everyone, it's Tom Kratz and I totally messed up on this podcast. Let me explain. I have two guests on this podcast and I didn't get them to share their story of how they got into the real estate business and it's a really big part of who they are and how they're able to share so much. And the reason I didn't do that is they were here for a bit of an informal mastermind. We invited Preston Letts from Chicago up here and Rob Minton from Ohio just outside Cleveland. These are guys that we've known for a long time. They've both helped us out in different ways in our business and we used to mastermind all together out in Rob's office just outside of Cleveland. So it was really cool to kind of host them here and talk about their businesses. We shared about our business and that's kind of how these mastermind things work. And we just did an informal podcast with them where I didn't get them to explain their backstory. So I just want to do that now. Rob Minton started a brokerage just outside Cleveland working with real estate investors almost exclusively. It's where we got a lot of ideas for how to create and run Rockstar. So he's been a great friend and a mentor to, to us for many years. So that is a bit of his story. He lives through the real estate kind of upswing and then the absolute monster crash in 2008, 2009. And Preston was also masterminding with us back then in Cleveland as well. And he created his own real estate business in the Chicago area, first from a real estate brokerage point of view. And then he launched a property management company after the real estate crisis and really grew that thing into a monster. And it was recently bought out. And that's kind of his backstory. So he has a lot of experience both in helping investors in the Chicago area and then launching and running and growing a really large property management company called Let's Property Management. So that's kind of where he gets his real estate information from. And I didn't get them to explain that. So I wanted you to know that here in the intro. In this On this podcast, I just got them to jump in and talk about that real estate crisis. And the reason that we wanted them to talk about that from each of their points of view is Nick and I are both short-term paranoid, long-term optimistic when it comes to real estate. We like to know the worst case scenario, but it doesn't actually freeze us. It doesn't stop us from taking action. We just like to know the worst case scenario so we can prepare for for it should it ever happen here. And that's why we got them to both share their, their viewpoints on what happened in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, that specific period. Then we go off way on a tangent and start talking about Instagram and social media. And then it comes back to real estate at the end. So This is a really kind of informal talk, not the typical origin story when we get started, but I think there's a lot of great, great information in there as well. And if you are listening to this and you're in the greater Toronto area and you want some real estate information for yourself, probably the best place to go to that we know of, and this is definitely self-serving because this is one of our websites, is rockstarinnercircle.com. That's rockstarinnercircle.com. And on that website, you can find links to all the books that we've put out. You can buy those books on amazon.ca or you can download digital copies of them for free on our website, rockstarinnercircle.com. You can get access to the class that we run, which is a free introductory 90-minute session for new investors or investors who want to learn how we are helping real estate investors all across the GTA in Southern Ontario here. You can get access to blog posts. You can access to videos on that website. So basically, everything that we're putting out is available at rockstarinnercircle.com. And with that, let's get on with the show. Are you ready to live life on your terms? Is it time to take charge? Real estate business building, the economy, health and nutrition, and more. It's the Your Life, Your Term Show with Tom and Nick Carazza. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, so we are live. Nick, can you hear me okay? No. Nope. I just want to make sure you can, can hear, hear me. You. So we have Preston Letts in the house here who, uh, I was going to make some joke on Chicago. Hey, you guys haven't had a basketball, a good basketball team in a long time. Uh, and, and the Bulls. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because they had Jordan know, forever. So you just Black you Hawks, win. And the Blackhawks Stanley Cups. No, I know. But so they have Preston, the Bears. The Bears suck. But we're not as bad as no, Cleveland. No, no, so we're, we're good now. We're really bad. No, I'm not really good. I mean, you're okay. <laughs> That's your middle of the pack there. Decent. I mean, hey, we have the Toronto if Argonauts. If mediocre is good to you, then I guess. You're Listen, good. We have, if we had a kicker last year. We would have, we would have gone a long, gone you, a long way. Do you know what pull the, the mic, Toronto, pull the mic nice and close, pull it nice and close. Do you know what the Toronto Argonauts are? Yes. You do? You do? Oh, absolutely. I know the CFL. Come on. Really? Oh, man. Yeah. I'm shocked. I think he knows it better than we know it. Probably. <laughs> Holy shit. That's shocking. I'm in the know. Yep. Um, so Preston lets us hear from Chicago. And the reason we know Preston is because of the other gentleman here. Um, Rob Minton from o- uh, Cleveland, Ohio is here as well. And Rob... We uh, got introduced to when I was going to quit my job and try to figure out real estate. Rob had started a brokerage in 
just outside Cleveland that was working with investors. And I called Nick going, holy mm -hmm. shit, some guy is running a brokerage that actually works with investors. And we ran down there and you, we, you taught us so much stuff over the years and you formed a mastermind group. And that's where we met Preston and we learned a lot from Preston. So both Nick and I have a lot to thank you for. You, Rob Minton, and you, Preston Let's. So thank you guys for being here. But enough with that stuff. We need to get right down to the, to, the, to, the, to the dirty questions here, which is most Canadian investors want to know, during a real estate correction in the U.S., what did you guys see? So maybe I could get from both your perspectives. I don't know, Rob, if you want to go first or Preston, sure. you want to go first. But like, what did you see? I think it's instructive for investors. Because a lot of investors here believe real estate can never go down because they've never seen a correction, so they have no, I and mean, then some older investors here do believe it can go down and don't really know what to fully expect. So what did you guys see? Well, you should, Rob, be, you should yeah. be, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say Rob will, Rob will make sure. Yeah, that, Rob's that, gonna that, make everybody that, cry yeah. and <laughs> tap out right I, now. No. <laughs> um, well, I, I definitely need to be prepared for any potential outcome because you, you, don't, have, you don't have control over the real estate market, so just, just Make, keep that in mind. I'm sure Tom and Nick, you know, work on that with you guys. Uh, but the thing that I guess the most important thing, Rob, to many people listening to this don't know us at all. You're going right across Canada on this podcast. Oh, oh, okay. I just want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens in a crash is that demand completely disappears for home purchases. So, so try to picture what a market would be like with no buyer demand whatsoever for real estate. So no buyer demand means that the prices drop and they could drop significantly and it has a massive ripple effect on m many different levels. Uh, but on the flip side, at least in the Cleveland, Ohio area, uh, we had very strong rental demand because people were moving out of their homes if they were letting their homes go into foreclosure. They needed, they, all these people became tenants. So the demand for rental properties increased even though the value of those properties had decreased. So there was a positive that went along with the, the negative. And, 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 and so investors who, what about straight up, so rental demand, um, is, it increased. And, and what about investors who owned properties? How did they, the ones who held onto the properties, it was because rent stayed solid and they could just make, you know, they could get by, even though the property values dropped, because what how, how far did property values come down? 50 to 70%. So 50 to 70%, but could they hold their properties because the rent stayed solid? They could if they had a, a long-term perspective. The problem is if you have a hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage and the property is now worth 50 you feel like you're 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 in debt an extra hundred thousand because your value is gone i uh, got it i never thought about it from that point you yeah, need totally. the long-term perspective yeah, that long-term perspective because if you're short term you're like screw it sell done. this thing you're i'm out. done you're out like that yeah you're out yeah, what, what about in chicago did, did the property values go down that to that level as well you know for us it was really dependent on the area uh, but yeah, we saw th the same thing and we're still in some areas, you know, I have some property, unfortunately that, you know, fortunately I have a long-term perspective that, you know, I'm still below value wise where I purchased them, uh, you know, back in 08, 09, but we saw that we definitely saw that we did see a little bit of, uh, decrease in, in, in what our rent prices and, and rent, you know, what, what the rent was at the time, maybe 20% the most. So we did see, you know, some owners where, you know, they were cash flowing and then they got real close to, to, to uh, break even or negative. Um, and then second to kind of Rob, we did see an increase in rental demand, but we also saw along with that, we did see a higher uh, uh, default rate where more of our tenants, tenants that we would screen and, and you know, have, you know, very high, um, you know, success with, we saw a higher, you know, higher likelihood that they were going to default. Not significantly, but definitely. And, we, and, and what kind of properties were those? I'm so, curious. Uh, it was really, you know, I, I'd say anything that it was more in the apartment side. Yeah. Okay. okay. Definitely in the lower income where our job market really tightened up. We went into a pretty high uh, unemployment rate. And so if you're, you know, if we were renting properties that were in the, you know, in, in the apartment side, 700 to let's say 1200 in the Chicago market and that tenant lost their job. That's probably a thirty to fifty thousand dollar a year income person. There, you know, the number of jobs out there for them, you know, yeah, just wasn't it. there. Got it. Yeah, you guys have lived through a lot. That's a, that's a rough stretch, man. Holy. Well, the crazy part being out now this far from it is that the investors who held and had that long term perspective, 
they their property their values came back slowly but surely they didn't rebound like the you know, quickly like the stock market but you know by now the values are probably back to where they were so you know it was very you, it's just a big difference between those who tapped out and walked away from everything have nothing and those investors who stayed are, are where they were before and now their mortgages are paid down 10 years they're in a completely better position because they stayed with that long-term perspective so hard for the the, the emotion we were talking about this before the emotional aspect though I, I can't you know that that's the tough side of it but some of them were like they were walking like it was strategic defaults right some of them Definitely. purposely were were leaving because and then uh, how, how did that work like for anyone that hadn't heard that like how did that work well, you you pick if you depending on how you have your assets, how you're holding them. If you have them in different entities, or if you're doing some asset planning, it gives you the ability to be somewhat strategic. If you want to let, if you want to, if you have a bad property, so to speak, you could just let that particular property go and try to keep the other properties. But what ends up happening is, is once you make the decision to do a strategic default, meaning you're going to stop making payments on your mortgage, like you're choosing to, you you're could make the to, ability to, but yeah, you're choosing, you're choosing, to, choosing stop. to. So a lot of investors chose they stopped making payments they kept continuing to collect rent to try to recover okay. some of their loss Got it. right yeah, Preston, you saw this too oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh really okay yeah, oh, yeah. okay and then they would play the game trying to delay the foreclosure as po long oh. as possible so their so they cash flow just cash went through flowing. the moon yeah, yeah. 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 it became so, very profitable for them but oh but the, but the flip side is that their credit scores now they're done credit wise you can't borrow another oh penny. god but even yeah, 10 yeah, years yeah. like 10 years later you still can't borrow like so if you do that and you let you know whatever five ten years you still can't borrow well it's it's like seven what is it seven, seven years seven. for foreclosure anyway, okay so something like that yeah. so seven years so yeah. but but that's so that's that was that was like i guess like a it wasn't uncommon like it was common relatively common Very that common. people were just like because it was taking a while for the banks to get around to try to repossess these properties right so for how long like a year two years people were able to just kind of collect this rent and not pay any mortgage payments it could have been longer than that yeah. i know uh, foreclosures that took up to three sometimes four years if somebody was actively fighting it then they could have delayed it you know, our whole court system was just so overloaded with just such a mass volume that um, we saw some crazy, you know, time frames for some of our clients. I, you know, I was in property management at the time, and I dealt with a lot of the tenants that would come to us crying because, you know, the sheriff showed up on their door and, you know, was getting ready to evict them. Yeah. And here for the last three years, the owner's been collecting rent and, and Holy smoke. Yeah, oh, situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't cool. think about oh that side gosh. of it. Yeah. You're yeah. right. Didn't think about that side of it at all. So, so what the tenant's uh, been paying rent, the investors taking the rent, but not paying it's like the what happened. It's like what happened to us yeah. with our, our last office yeah. Yeah. in yeah. Burlington when we were subleasing off someone. Yeah. That's the same thing that happened. When the but security guard showed up and kicked us out, yeah, that, that's brutal situations. Yeah. Then but that were some investors that would do that. Others would would, as they could tell, it was getting a little closer. They would give them a ninety day notice and say, you know, hey, you need to find, you know, terminate the lease, find another. Okay, heads situation. up, I'm about to lose this yeah, house. Right, you better right, move right, on. Yeah. And then you to take the next couple months for free to to move. Um, but how you handled it, a lot of investors actually profited once they made that decision to do a strategic default. If you were smart about it you could recoup some of your losses by how you how you played the game because you you got the cash flow for a few years or did, did some people negotiate with the bank and get these properties back afterwards yeah there was all, all kinds, all of, kinds stuff, of stuff yeah. there's always opportunity yeah, right yeah, in yeah, some way shape or yeah. form you have to change how you see it but definitely okay there's the biggest thing you're saying though i never really thought of it it's if, if you don't have the long-term perspective and you see a property value yeah, get cut you just half, freak out you're just you're like forget this so you the long-term perspective is everything that's what you guys were talking about last night, no? About that's where all the life. value is. I mean, that's the only way you're guaranteed to win. If you have a short-term perspective, you, you, your your risk is inflated astronomically. And so it's anything, like any anything, asset, really. Yeah. It's not just a real estate thing. It's it's anywhere, right? Look at the market, stock market. It's the so only way you one, win. Well, look, you buy Uber stock, whatever, last week or two weeks ago after the IPO, and it's dropped right now. I don't know what's going to happen in Uber, but the only way now is if you sell now, you're guaranteed to lose. If it ends up being in a profitable company, which is, I guess up for debate because of the Silicon Valley company, a lot of them decide that profit isn't a thing they're after. Um, but, uh, but it's the only way you can, you can make it work. Yeah. I mean, it's the one advantage that you can, you can actually control is your, your long, if you have a long term perspective, 
you you increase your odds of su- success dramatically. So how has this affected you guys this guy, uh, now? Like, would you guys ever do like a flip in real estate short term that maybe was going to take you a year? You buy a property, and, fi- and I'm not saying either of you are doing this, but would you even mentally consider that? Because right in the middle of that year, maybe there's another correction, and then you're caught holding like this this property. Would you guys ever do something like that or no? I, are, so, they, are you like past it? And you're like, okay, no, I'm good. I can. No, you know what I what I would say is it it puts me, I'm much more conservative now than I was then, and you know, and really in everything I do, and and a lot of that goes back to you know going through the crash. I would do it, but I would underwrite it with, hey, if I'm going to do this, and here's the worst case situation, can I live with that? And okay. you know, is this could this turn into a potential rental? You know, what what are what are my you know, what's your worst case situation? Exactly. And what are my exit strategies? What's my, you know, what's my safety net in the event that something goes wrong and do a lot of analysis and, and pass on a lot of really good deals because it's, eh, you know what, I don't really want to take that much risk right now. I, I feel like to give perspective, we should give everyone an idea of what Preston, like you're, you were property managing and you're still involved in the company, but the, the property management company you had had how many units under, like what you were managing? So we were, about 850 properties and we were managing actually still are about 1400 units yeah so just to give everyone an idea of just some perspective on you know there's a lot of knowledge and experience that you're seeing over the years when you're managing that amount of real estate in the chicago area and a lot of crazy stories i'd imagine too oh i mean <laughs> I, I, you'd be amazed at the stories and and we you know we go into you know we go in everything we're, we're unique we manage everything from a, a 500 dollars a month studio maybe 400 450 in, in chicago in a very rough neighborhood to a Two bedroom, two bath, and Trump Tower for ten thousand dollars a month, and everything in between. So we so is see it, is everything. the Trump Tower ten thousand dollars a month easier to manage than the four hundred dollars a month, four fifty? One hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> actually, you'd be surprised. Those tenants yeah, were sure a little. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would yeah. like a tiger in my. Condo. Well, our parents. I mean, our parents had a high end home that they were renting out because the market crashed here a while ago, and, and those tenants were they weren't ideal tenants even at that level. Right. And then we they had found out that there was a history of a repeated pattern that they had done the same thing to other other people as well. So it's it doesn't matter just, you know, the price point doesn't really necessarily matter. Like, exactly. Right? And just for some more context, Preston, I, th- I don't know if you know this. I think Rob knows this. Our family almost went bankrupt here in this country in 1990 because there was a massive real estate correction. A huge one, kind of like what you guys went on a national level, but it was it was isolated more to the Toronto area, and uh, we almost lost. Our father was flipping properties, and this one went from seven hundred fifty thousand dollars down to four fifty in four months, oh my and we almost lost the, the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars twenty nine years ago. Oh, wow. So you can imagine, yeah. right? It was like forty four hundred square feet, three car garage, and. Uh, it's shaped our futures because Nick and I, even getting into this business, in the back of our minds, we're like kind of how you're mm-hmm. more conservative. A lot of investors, I remember early on with Rockstar, some people would come to us and said, tell us, you guys just don't have the wealth mindset because you can become a millionaire overnight by flipping these three properties. And we're like, guys, no, like you can. There, there's high risk, high reward, definitely. But are you willing to take that risk? And from our mindset, seeing what our friends in the US went through and from our own family in 1990, we just see too much risk in what you're talking about. So it's always kind of held us to the starter homes and good communities, like right. good homes and good areas thing. And uh, it's fra- it's it's given us like a little bit of a of a bias, but it's the long term perspective seems to win. Always so, does. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Nick, I don't know. I we maybe have beat that one up a little bit, but I was interested in kind of the U.S. things. But I think mentally, you guys are past it now, right? Is it still? Rob, how about Rob, you, Preston? I don't think, I don't think I don't, Rob yeah, is. Yeah, I think yeah. Preston might Preston be. I'm not sure is. Rob is. You're in, well, if Cleveland went down... So I have no sympathy for Cleveland, okay? They kicked out the Raptors how many times in the playoffs? Yeah. We're, we're done. We don't care. Yeah. We don't have okay? that yeah, gentleman yeah. anymore. Mr. LeBron left. No, so, yeah. uh, but no one in Toronto we still don't has like any you. sympathy for Cleveland, <laughs> yeah. man. LeBron <laughs> smashed well, our faces in year after year after year. And he year. chugged a beer during a game or something. Didn't he do that, yeah. that one time? Yeah, he was drinking wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. But uh, well, we have the Browns, so we've had a rough couple of years. Yeah, that's so. fair. But you must see investors now in 2019 buying properties, and 10 years ago they weren't even investing, so they have no clue. What they have no clue, right? No it, clue. Yeah. yeah, and and are you going to go back into? Yeah, we were talking about this. Are you going to start helping people again buy properties? Well, it's on the record now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a potential. There's I like the way potential. Preston's looking over at yes. Rob right now. What's he gonna say? Yeah. Is this gonna become like uh, another therapy session? For yeah, 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 yeah. It no, can be. 
Yeah, we were telling Rob. Yeah, we were telling Rob at lunch that uh, a lot of people you are do a such good job at helping people that people need you to kind of help them in the real estate investing world, whether you know it or not. Um, so then, what's next for you? Are you? What about your kids? Do you guys both tell your kids the property investing is the way to go? Is that something that you guys believe in, or no? You know, I have two daughters, and they have zero interest in what I do. They just know that money comes to the house you know i have a bunch of rental properties and so i try to just say I like, like that they just know that money comes, comes to, to the, the house. house yeah like what when, kind of house do you live in well we live in a house where yeah. money comes to it yeah well like <laughs> they have a hard time to trying to describe what i do because i have a bunch of rental properties so uh if i need money i just go to the post office box and pick up some rent checks i mean it's so but but i try to do say hey this property i'll drive by a pro house i said this property paid for this i try to like connect the dots but they have Unfortunately, at this age of zero interest in investing. Yeah, well, you rent out a lot of mobile homes now. Uh, yeah, we have. A, I do. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's been and that's been worthwhile for you, too, which a lot of people probably don't understand. I mean, there's not I don't think there's the same uh, the same amount of mobile home parks around here. I don't think it's as, anywhere as, close. As we some, don't seem some, to have that. Yeah. We have some. I know when well, we're going actually to Ohio, probably either to see you or maybe to a Kennedy conference one time when we were driving through Niagara, we drove through off right off the highway. There was a couple of mobile home parks. We're like, oh yeah, I wonder how we could make that work similar to the, you know, the way you've been doing it, right? And you offer those on rent to own programs to people, and that's been that's been working for you pretty. Well. That is so. Is that that's the primary focus over single family stuff, correct? Well, the re the return on investment is much higher. Yeah. And another benefit is that you can typically just buy those for cash. You don't need any financing whatsoever. So you so if you're more conservative, like Preston and I are from the crash, any opportunity we can create cash flow without debt is one we're going to be in interested in. Can you so, give us an example of the number so people can just just a general <clears throat> ballpark? Uh, so, you know, with with manufactured homes. The opportunity is there because someone who's trying to sell the home, it's very hard for them to sell it because lenders don't want to loan money on an older manufactured home. So that actually brings the price of those properties down because there's really no demand. So that means you can come in and pay cash for the property um, at a very attractive price point, and then you can offer it for sale on a rent to own or with financing. And um, so you might pay eight to ten thousand for a home, and then you sell it for three hundred dollars a month for six, seven years, and then the person they're they're responsible for maintenance and repairs and taxes, and you just kind of become the bank and helping them buy the home because lenders won't do that. So you can so you're buying it, and in three years you're getting fully paid back what you bought the property. Usually at two years. Yeah, it's a really years. nice model. It's without so debt. There's zero leverage. So. So if you, you buy this in cash, within two to three years, you get all your investment back. Correct. Yeah. And then it's two to three hundred dollars a month, every month going forward, free cash flow. Free cash flow. And then if the person moves out of the home for whatever reason, it's a massive win because you get to resell it again and start the payments back at month one and collect another six or seven years of. Of payments on that particular property and if they damage one like if they 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 kind of like you know if it turns into a meth lab how much do you have to um you know what's the cost to renovate one of those things like a few thousand bucks or yeah, yeah 1500 to 2000 u.s dollars and then yeah, if you're so doing you get that and you get that back for yeah so i mean why are you laughing at the u.s dollar 550 grand i like canadian. how you guys slipped in a canadian you laughed at the canadian dollar the president right, right away had a reaction to that he wasn't even to be yeah canadian dollar sucks oh, except when they found out that we're not paying for prescriptions anymore all of a sudden yeah. they got, they're like yeah. hey yeah. Wait, what's going on yeah. 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 free health care um so so then if, if they're doing that in a nine you get it paid off in two to three years the next six years on that program is free cash flow if they complete the payments then they own the the home correct but you've gotten six years of basically cash flow correct and you're on you're on to the next thing and within two years you take your original investment back and roll it into another property exactly yeah yeah okay so you've hit the holy grail on that kind of stuff yeah those numbers are uh, you know yeah, it's yeah. crazy it's just the cost of like the cost of property and, I, and i'm not talking about the manufactured homes even like just because the cost of properties are lower in those areas the cost of living is lower and you get numbers like that it's it, it changes it's changes well, life pretty quick well those dynamics the numbers won't be the same but the profit opportunity will be the same in any area it's just simply because of how the market is for manufactured homes and there's not financing available which brings the price point down so any asset you can buy for pennies, or for below its value, you're already putting yourself in a position to make attractive cash flow on it. But, but there's, you, there's like a rental fee in the park or something, right? Like who pays that? The person that I put into my home. So if I, I do a rent-to-own program, that rent-to-own buyer signs a lease with the park and pays the 
park the, the monthly how much do they like roughly i know it will depend on the park but like in a ballpark what, what does someone pay for that type of thing so so they'll pay a monthly lot rent of around 300 320 and then they usually have a payment on the home itself for 300 so for 600 hours a month or 650 a month they're, they're buying home. a home which they probably wouldn't have ever been able to do otherwise because no there's sure. no loans available so and they'll have the home paid off and like it's like a car almost right so they, they now have a home paid off in in six years or whatever five six years and um it's actually a very good option for them and that's why the whole thing makes sense because it's a win-win across the board yeah, I don't know if they're. I don't know if are there mobile home parks or these manufactured homes. You call them manufactured homes. I call them mobile homes. You call them. Well, manufactured you guys have your funky accent, but it's yeah. manufactured. Is it manufactured <laughs> homes? Okay, it's manufactured homes. There, there are. I, I remember even in Mississauga, there was that one at Dundas yeah, and Dixie. Yeah, but right? I mean, that was that one. Way I don't. Back. I don't know how many there are. I don't. I, it's not the space I've ever really looked into, but I, I know they exist. You have yeah. to. You, you know, the crazy part is, is until you look for them, you you're not paying attention to them. So if you start to look for them, you might be surprised. Oh, my gosh. And how are you able to buy so many of these things? People, you're finding them, just people are selling them? Uh, well, what happens is it compounds, right? So you, you buy, if you if you try to make a goal to buy one a month or what, whatever your goal is, at, at some point in time, like, gonna, you're buying one a month. <laughs> Never mind one property a year. Fighting with the one bank, a month. pleading with yeah, the yeah, bank, okay. please yeah. give me you're a mortgage. one a month. No, but so you think about it. So if it, at 10 months, you've got 10 of these homes. You're now generating $3,000 a month of cash flow. You have zero debt service. So now you're almost at the point, depending on what you're buying, you can buy, it's, it's, it funds itself so that you can buy one new property every, every month. So you're, you can get that money reinvested so quickly versus investing out of your pocket. If you, yeah, no, got yeah. it. Got it. Yeah, you've been doing that for uh, about 10 years now or more? Uh, yeah, a long time. So over time, you can build a very large portfolio of these assets. Got it. Would you ever go back into single family home, re regular residential stuff outside Cleveland? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Why? But why? Like if these mobile homes are like this, why? It goes back to the long term perspective, right? I mean, a single family home, you're buying a potentially a legacy asset. Yeah. OK. Uh, a manufactured home. They do have a, a life span. OK. Yeah. I mean, you can. When a home gets run down or a meth lab or whatever you want to say, you can re, you I can see, rent it. I have visions of Breaking Bad. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm every thinking every too. I think, yeah, I think like, it's oh great. Oh my God, yeah. but this is positive. We can have like Breaking Bad. But you could rebuild the home. You know what I'm saying? So that's like, even though it's 30 years old, but I can put a new furnace yeah, in. I can put a new, yeah. you know. So. The manufactured home kind of, it's harder to just keep it up for long term. It's great for cash flow, but long term. Then the tenant yeah, profile has okay. got to be different too, right? I mean, the, and the difference with a, a single family. So the tenant profile and you own a piece of land. Yeah. With the single family stuff, like but you, how different you own is property. the tenant profile really? You use the same metrics yeah. as you would on a single. You you want to you know do they have stable income? Have they been evicted? All the normal things you would look for, you do the same thing. And then in a manufactured home, can you have on a rent to own? So did they have a lease with you that you can you, can you evict them easily? You, you, they, I have a lease agreement and a sales agreement, so then I can evict on the lease agreement if I need to. Because in Ohio, are you using some state laws to evict? How does it work in Ohio? Well, in Ohio, uh, no, it's the typical real estate laws, tenant okay. landlord laws. Yeah. Okay. All right, here we have like a tenancy act and we have to kind of abide by the tenancy act. Sounds like you have something similar. Yeah, you have to follow normal protocol. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. okay. You, you, know, you have to put a three-day notice on the do the normal stuff you would do. Yeah, okay. Three-day notice, yeah. We Ours have to mail a notice. It's 14, then we got to yeah. go. That's why I like commercial. You Americans, man, you're vicious. Yeah. Commercial's the best. Days. It's like, we don't like, you didn't Cleveland, pay rent. not Chicago. No, gonna, Chicago oh, Chicago's more, oh, Chicago's more Canadian. Okay. What's the oh, process yeah. in Chicago? So if someone doesn't pay rent, how do you get them out? So we do a uh, five-day notice, and at the you know at five days, then oh, you really went. You have three days to well, five days. Easy wow, now. you really. No, it's not. It's not that different. <laughs> the, the difference really comes in, and, and and it's mainly you know one of the you know county is, um, you know then you file for you know then you go and file forcible entry, and then uh, that'll take fourteen to twenty-one days to get a court date, and if you can't get service, then it can get extended. So two, long, two months. Yeah. Well, long story short, the other challenge though is is our uh, our counties will allow for a jury trial. So a tenant can walk in and go, "I want a jury trial." A they jury trial for eviction? Yes. <laughs> oh, wow, that's with, with the live people as the jury. Yes. <laughs> with jurors. What do you think is going to be like what? a video game, like artificial I'm, intelligence? You're having a jury trial for an <laughs> eviction on either. rent that's documented on a lease. Yeah. That's crazy. I didn't know. And, that. and they don't have to have a reason. They all they have to do is request it. And what happens to the do people trial? do? But okay, what? so it's a it's a trial, and they're you know they're and the, the landlord is put on trial. Yeah. Well, it's I mean it's it's you know the 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 landlord is the uh, the plaintiff. Okay. And the, got so it. they're you know it's really 
uh, you know, it's a, it, it's a trial on the facts of okay. did the tenant pay or not? <laughs> and the tenant is obviously going to try to say they, you know, there was something wrong with the property. Yeah. Really what they do is they do it to Delay. drag out because, you know, they, you get to that point and then you ask for a jury trial. Well, that's another 30, 60 days. probably. Exactly. Right? Uh, but out of all the evictions that you've done, because you've managed a lot of properties out of all the eviction, what percentage of them would you estimate that went to jury trial oh it's a real small percentage yeah. and really what it is is it tends to be people that are professional yeah. tenants yeah, yeah. yeah. They, okay. they know they know the system, know the system. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah can you do that in ohio too a jury trial no thank goodness yeah that's it's yeah. Great. can you imagine just think how much time and energy is put into that trial not just the judge and the representatives and the tenant landlord but the jury people like having to leave work to be on the jury for this thing that the crazy is part crazy. is some of these tenants who are professional tenants would be awesome business owners oh. if they oh just God. took the same effort and yeah. put it into some business absolutely it would be amazing business owners uh a person i forget you maybe you guys talked about it last night when i wasn't there do you have kids I do. Do you talk to them about money and like how old are they? I've got 17, 16, and four. I thought you were going to say I have 17 kids. No, 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 no. <laughs> 17, 16, and four. No, no. Okay. And do you, I don't know, do you kind of, does the subject come up? Do you talk to them about cash? Do you talk to them about properties at all? Absolutely. I mean, I, I talk to, I try to be as open as I can about, you know, financial, our finances, uh, you know, uh, what I do, you know, real estate, et cetera. And it's one of those things where I, I feel like, kids today especially you know my kids are very similar to rob's there's not really any interest in sure what you know, dad does exactly yeah. the only thing they know is they don't want to be a property manager Got it. does <laughs> do you, cash come to your house like it comes to rob's house no no, no. So do you rob guys only has that. do you guys do you surf instagram with your kids together and you compare things <laughs> we will yeah we will. we'll sit next to each other and look at each other no but instagram up here i don't know if you guys know this in canada instagram took away not all accounts you can see how many uh, likes that your posts get there's a trial really? happening oh, that's in canada right. yeah that's right i and it's that. up here. It's live right now. So on the Rockstar Inner Circle um, Instagram account, now you don't see how many people like to post. You just whatever. see your friends' names, and then it yeah. says, and others. Yeah. That's and we were it. having a big debate about this in the office yesterday because I thought, this is pure bullshit because these companies are going to Congress in the U.S., and they're saying, you know, we a lot of kids have, like, self-esteem issues because when they post, they don't maybe get a lot of likes, since other people do. But they're not doing it for that. I was arguing with this about somebody just yesterday. I'm like, they're totally not doing it for that. That's the cover story. They're doing it because if you don't see how many likes that other people get, it, you're more willing to do stuff yourself. Mm -hmm. You're more willing to post on the platform because you're not so scared that everyone's going to see that your post, quote unquote, only got 10 likes when your buddy got like 50 yeah, likes. Yeah, I think it serves two purposes. Because because there's I lawsuits. Think it only serves that purpose. No, but there's lawsuits forming against them, so they can say now. Do you know what I mean? Like they they've been trying to address the issues, but there are lawsuits now forming class action against social media companies because they've they've not only. But it's if, like if, the social if, media companies knew about the 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 the. Um, yeah, the negative effects it's having thank on you. kids. Negative but here, but, I was but, for. No, but here's my point though. Mm -hmm. If this wasn't positive for their business. They wouldn't even try yeah, this experiment. Yeah, I agree. They're only trying this experiment to see if there's more engagement. Because if you have now 100 people posting because no one's, you know, instead yeah. of like just 10. Because you're not worried about it. Because you're not worried about how many likes you get. The problem is on the back end, you can still see your likes. So maybe you don't care because you're just. On the back saying, end, you can't. Yeah, like yeah, your yeah. own post, you yeah. can still see it. But I guess you're not worried because if I post something and, and three people like it, well, no one else is going to really know that it's only three. Yeah. Do you, right? guys, do you guys realize we're talking about Instagram likes? Yeah, no, I know. It's ridiculous. <laughs> No, I know. Rob's not on social. You're not on social media at all. <laughs> no. Not even Facebook? It, it's a massive distraction. No, he yeah. is. It's at okay. Hermit Rob. You know what? Rob actually <laughs> has some really good insights. Rob, uh, so what do you think, wh where do people spend uh, the, you know, most of their time incorrectly? On unimportant things. And how do they, no, but what are those unimportant things? Well, will it matter in three years, five years? If it doesn't matter in three or five years, then it's unimportant. So if someone, yeah, I see what you're saying. So like, you know, so, this Instagram thing. That was so ma what, yeah. that was a matter of fact. So we work to live, right? We don't live to work. So, you know, I enjoy certain things. So some people may say, well, that's a distraction. That's unimportant. So where do you draw that line where you say, okay, well, you know, we're all here. You know, we're all working. I mean, I enjoy what I do sometimes um, as a property manager. Um, I, I love the business. I love real estate. But you, you know, can justify it all the way you want. We know how no. to, how tough that business but I, is. But at the end of the day, I'm I'm there for a selfish reason. I want to. I need money to feed my family and and to live the life and lifestyle that I want. So where do you draw the line of of you know of what's unimportant and? Do you ever regret spending time on Instagram? 
No. But I see Preston. No, 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 no. But no, in defense of Preston, I, I see where his point is that you, but, you, are you using it like a break, like an outlet? Like you're absolutely. just checking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think his point is, hey, man, he works really hard every once in a while through the day. If he's not going to look at the newspaper, he can I'm choose not, to look at Instagram. I'm not arguing with that, but I'm like, so tell me you have dinner. Your wife's there. She's on her phone. She's on oh, her no, Instagram. No, 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 no. We don't do that. No, no, no. We don't do that. And you're sitting in, on the same couch do you, at nine or 10 o'clock. You're like, Oh my god! I just wasted yeah. another night looking at stupid shit. I mean, that, I feel that way about TV, but not about Instagram. <laughs> but that's happening right across North Canada and the U.S. for sure. Well, that's my point. Is is like, how many nights do I want to spend looking at all this fake stuff on my phone? Like, isn't there more to life than that? That's my perspective. I understand what you're saying. It's like, hey, it's my downtime. I don't have to think about it. I get a laugh or yeah. two. But yeah, I think it's unique to everyone. And but I think to be fair, we, people can there can be a positive to social media because there is a positive right sincere there is some positive but with the positive you got to acknowledge the negative too and if you can control the negative and focus on the positive then maybe it's worthwhile but for i think for a lot of people the negative just really overruns the positive and and it, it, to your point it just becomes like well then you know, if the negative is outweighing the positive, then I don't know. To me, it's a negative. It's not in between. It's like it's actually a negative. There's there's no in between. It's either bad or good. If the bad overweighs the good, it's bad. Right. So, Rob, I'm curious. How do you catch yourself when we all have our bad habits? And you're like, oh, I got to break that. Do you do something where you're like, oh, I shouldn't be thinking this way or I shouldn't be doing this? Do you have anything to kind of break you out of a little uh, cycle? I just try to replace it with something better. You know, instead of sitting on social media, maybe grabbing a book. I, I mean, it's doing something where there's maybe some value that that you can use or leverage going forward. Maybe you can through social media, but for me, it's just trying to just upgrade that action slightly. I don't think what there's about much the you can get. From but what about the people? So like, as you say that, I, I actually don't agree with this, but I just want to play devil's advocate for a second. So what about the people that say, okay, well, look, so you're sitting on the couch and you know, your wife or you're going through social media, you're going through Instagram and you're looking at stuff. But instead of that, you're going to grab a book and you're going to sit on the same couch and you're not going to actually be talking to your wife because you're sitting there reading a book. So isn't it the same thing? No, that's a good point. But I think uh, Rob's point is you're feeding your mind with some good information instead of some nonsense. I kind of agree with well, that, but I've just, like I said, playing devil's advocate here. Everyone in this room has turned books into money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how can you argue with reading a book that you're going to take something from and turn it into money or cash flow? So I, I, I'm i not on Instagram. I haven't turned anything from Instagram into money, but a, a book is a much better investment, at least for me, of my time. So Yeah. I shared last night with these guys that uh, I took myself off Instagram. I don't really check anything about it. I don't know how many months ago now, four or five months. And for me personally, I'm not saying it's the right answer for everyone, but for me personally, I'm, I feel just in a better state of mind because of it. Cause I just found that sometimes I would go down a rabbit hole and I'd, I'd look at some funny videos. And then there was a couple of people I followed that I felt like I got some value from because I'm like, Oh, I just like to see what they're up to. So, the, you know, there was some positive there, but for some reason, for whatever reason it was, when I got, when I spent the time on Instagram and I was looking at stuff, by the time I got off it, I noticed for me, my state of mind and my kind of, it had, it had shifted and I wasn't kind of who I was before and I didn't like it. And now that I'm not doing that, I find overall it's better because I was primarily doing that a little bit in the evening at home. And I, I just, it was just for me, it, you know, the way that things are structured in my life, it was a bad habit and I'm, I'm better for, I feel like I'm better off not doing it. You know, I'm not but, saying it's the right answer for everyone, but for me, it's definitely it's definitely better. So I'm off it completely. Well, and, think about our kids. So if you're feeling that, y our kids are feeling that too. And how do they escape that? That's that's the question. That's, so that's an interesting thing because I don't understand with our kids growing up, and I'm sure Preston, your kids are, are kind of on Instagram. Rob, your your kids are probably on Instagram. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. They're growing up with this. I find they handle it so much better than than the way Nick's describing or the way we do. No, because well, when I, I when I see when I question my yeah. son about it, I'm like to him, I'm like, you know, oh, all these likes or all this nonsense. He's like, yeah, whatever. It's, it it doesn't seem to be affecting. I him. have daughters, um, yeah. and you know, it's hard. They, it's it's like your neighbor gets a new car, and you're like, ah, oh, damn, I I I, I should get it. My car yeah, sucks, okay, right? Got it. So now got you're it. on Instagram, and your friend is doing something, and you're not included in that, and your nice night just kind of went down the drain because you. You feel inferior. I in guess my fashion. point is, if you're growing up, if that's your normal, 
that since you were a kid, you just kind of always see that? Is Does it even ruin your night? We or is it just normal? I, I guess we won't know for five or yeah. ten years. Yeah, because I'm just wondering, it's like, mm-hmm. remember when we were kids, like our mom, who's sitting right next door here, mm-hmm. said, stop playing video games because you're going to, I don't know what she said, maybe I was going to go crazy or something. <laughs> oh, And don't sit so close to the TV playing video games yeah. because it's going to be bad for your eyesight. I'm 46, my eyesight is perfect, and I sat in front of Nintendo. You know how much Super Mario I played? NHL, you know how much, no, <laughs> NHL I played? Like it's Duck all in front of the team. Oh yeah, all of it. I was on my Vic Twenty playing Gorf. Do you remember Gorf? Yeah. Gorf. My my only uh-huh. thought my uh, Gorf I don't really remember. Well, no. I was like way back. You were old. Dude, I was I'm a not. bit of a geek too, man. I played. <laughs> I, I I programmed. I created some games in like basic. My uh my only thought on that is it's like uh, you know I I equate it to like people's diet or exercise right they're like i don't know i feel pretty good like i don't i don't need to kind of look into that and then all of a sudden they change their diet to be better and they start exercising and they're, and then all of a sudden they feel much better and then if they they change their diet back to what they were doing they're like wow i feel like crap so they it's almost like you don't know what you don't know right so and i don't know if that's accurate but that's the way i look at it so it's like before you kind of change some of this stuff you're like nick i don't know what you're talking about like i feel good and then when you change it you're like wow like i actually feel much better and now when i go back to the old ways i don't feel nearly as good so i just wonder if there is a little bit of that so because they've grown up with it they don't know life without it and maybe it can be much better okay, but they've just yeah. never I'm been exposed to, to it that. Right? Sure. Yeah, i don't know i'm sense. not saying that's that's i just i feel like there might be at least for some of them that that would come into play, but I, I what the hell do I know? I'm but not, I'm not right, a professional. Let me just ask one question. Thing. So, if you are anytime you have a down second, if you us or our children, you pick up your phone and you need some type of stimulation. Yeah, and, that's bad. What does that do for you? Your like, attention span. I notice my personal attention span. Can in the you last read a book anymore? Years. Like, yeah. can you, like uh, I found it's harder for me to sit. Down. I used to be able to sit down well over an hour into a book easy. Now I fifteen find, minutes. You're freaking out yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, so I don't know if it's that. kids. Yeah, 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 I've I've made a, a a mental, and it's so it's it's amazing how hard it is. And I challenge anyone like listening to try to do this. Like you're standing in line at the grocery store, and there's not one person. There's like four or five people in front of you. Try to stand there and just look around and not grab your phone and look at something. Do you know how flipping hard it is? Well, you look it's like, tough, only, man. Not only that, notice how everyone else has their phones out yeah. in the line. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, now you look like a creepy guy, too, by the way, because you're not on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I do that little <laughs> test with myself all the time, and I end up just reading all those National Enquirer headlines. <laughs> and then the marketer in me starts wanting to write them down because I'm like, damn, These that's are a good, good headline right there. <laughs> it's like so-and-so, Megan. Who's the Megan person who had a baby and with Megan Harry? Markle. Mar- yeah, Mar- yeah. Markle, yeah. And there's yeah. like a good headline about her... her and the, did you know they named the baby Archie? Yeah, I love Archie, man. Archie I'm comics. I'm blown away that. Do you know how many Archie comics I've read I in my it was life? A joke. Carol told me they named the baby Archie. I'm like, what? Archie? I didn't like. You got to be hardcore British. <laughs> Archie's really cool. Okay, I don't yeah, want to talk. Listen, and Riverdale on Netflix. If you're not watching it, you should. I'm get I'm this, plug. I'm let, plug let me this. try to get this back on track just a little bit. <laughs> Preston in Chicago right now. If you're working with an investor who's like from Toronto, doesn't know moving to Chicago, but they want to pick up some investments. Is there something you would steer them to an individual? Like, would you be going to a single family home suburb in Toronto, a condo? The south side where all the gangs and drugs are, maybe. (laughs) Is that the south side of Chicago? Where's where's all the gangs and drugs? Yeah. South side? South side. So is that where we hang out? Yeah, that's where we go. Good drugs? (laughs) Good drugs? Can we get them and import them into Canada? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I would, uh, yeah, there's specific areas. I mean, th- one of the challenges to our market is, is you really have to know it. And if you don't know it, you can get burned really quickly. Can, can you get like a cat? Can you get a pro a single family home? I guess how far would you have to go out of Chicago to get a single family home to rent to cover its costs? Oh, no, I mean, you could be, you could be within Chicago and, oh, okay. and I mean, our cap rates are still, you know, really good. I mean, we still have eight, nine, 10 caps that we're seeing Even on, on like regular... a single family home. Oh, mean? absolutely. Absolutely, okay. and that's in a good. That's in a a, a de- like a decent area of Chicago. Yeah. Oh, oh so yeah. Can you give us price points so we can kind of just visualize this? So I would say, uh, you know, where where I I would look to uh, to to push individuals is is really between seventy five to like one seventy five. We see a lot of good, um, you know, we see a lot of good gross yields that'll be in the. We talk a lot of gross yields, just you know, annualized rent divided by the the price of the house. We'll see. 13 to 15 percent very easily um, between that 75 to 175. And how much are those renting out for? Uh, they'll go from 1100 up to 2000 So everyone in Toronto, just everyone listening to this, just freaked out because you mean you can buy a house from 75000 to 150000 yep. And that's getting you what? Like a, is that a two-bedroom house, a three-bedroom house? 
two to three bedroom the driveway up the side yeah 50 years old maybe 60 years old our, like our housing stock's older so you know we have i mean we have a lot of properties you know homes that were built in the early 1900s we have some that are late 1800s uh okay. to Got 1950 it. you know that that's kind of where you're going to see our housing stock. and if i'm buying a hundred and fifty thousand dollar home the neighborhood that i'm in that you're picturing is what kind of neighborhood i mean it's a i would say it's a it's a blue collar you know uh middle class area do, do I, does it need renovations though at that price point? Like, do I have to do work to it before I can rent it out? No, I, no. I mean, so we've got a property under contract right now. It, it's, you know, this one's a little bit lower socio, socioeconomic area. It's under contract for 70, I think 65, and it's pulling 1350 in rent. So, parking, yeah, just so you know, parking smokes. lots, what are parking lots? About parking spots, like 40 grand now? Uh, yeah. Like in Toronto, parking, yeah. Lot, yeah. that's like 50% of the value of that home is a parking spot in, in, in Toronto. Well, I mean, that's downtown core. That's This is a little bit outside probably the core of the, the city, right? Yeah. But, but and still. how's investor demand? Are you, are, do you have, like, are Americans in there piling and buying these properties as investments? You know, what I would say is, is we were talking about this at lunch where, you know, the, the, you know, investors are really kind of a lot driven by uh, the me- you know, media and what's yeah, going on yeah. in the media and, and what's really kind of the, the, the taste for um, investing. And, and that's definitely on the rise. I mean, we, we're starting to really see, I mean, you know, it significantly start to pick up where you're getting new investors that are coming in. They're like, hey, I've invested before. I want to I want to start to look to pick something up. You know, the is this where you stable. said that some people from California are investing in Chicago? Yeah. So you're seeing that we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of we get you know, international clients on a regular basis. Um, you know, our, we're a big metropolitan area. You know, it's well known. Um, we have some issues with our taxes. Uh, so, they're a little expensive. So but, if I want to buy a property for 350000 what, what what kind of property am I looking at then? You know, it'd be, it'd be dependent on the area, but the areas that I would push people yeah. to, you're you're looking at. I mean, you, you wouldn't be able to. We, we definitely cap out. Okay. So that, that $350,000 home, you know, in, in areas that I would push people to would, would really probably cap out around two. Well, I'd say probably 2500 maybe 3000 okay. from a rent standpoint. So it does make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. There's definitely a... Okay, a, so that sweet spot is what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Okay. It doesn't make sense. I don't know. My math is still makes yeah, sense. Yeah, no, well, I mean, we're just dealing yeah. with a different world here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And then Rob, out in... The I guess is that the east side of Cleveland. What 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 kind of price points for single family homes? Can you just paint a picture? Because I don't think most of us I mean, here know. I joke about Cleveland, but it's an amazing area, and I I, I don't think I'd be where I am today financially without the, the price points being where they are. So, uh, you could buy a single family home, a nice three bedroom single family home for maybe eighty thousand. You could probably rent it for twelve hundred, and the taxes aren't nearly as high as other areas. So the cash flow is very very attractive in in, in Cleveland. And that eighty thousand dollar home is it needing a lot of work? No, I'm you know. Paint. Is that like we've been out there looking at? Those, yeah. So that's like sometimes a two story house, even right? Yeah, a bungalow colonial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah got yeah. it. Okay, yeah. driveway up the side, yeah, garage, garage maybe at the end of the driveway. Yeah. What kind of lots are those on? I forget. Is it 30, 40 foot? Forty foot. Forty by, by yeah, one one twenty or yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. Got Little it. cookie cutter. Okay. First time buyer type home. What would okay. be the taxes on that? Uh, thirteen hundred a year. That's really good. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, that's thirteen hundred a yeah. year is yeah. the property taxes. So the the benefit to Cleveland is that the cash flow is super attractive. The negative is that we don't have super appreciation. strong appreciation. Yeah. But if you take the cash flow and reinvest it into other assets, you can kind of get the same result. But um, so we we don't we don't have both. You guys have cash flow and appreciation. Mm-hmm. We've got very attractive cash flow. Mm-hmm. Our cash flow, we've had to get more and more creative to kind of find ways to create the right. cash flow. But yeah, you can still find it here for sure. But uh, and that's uh, but I mean that's kind of like a renewed focus for you, which is kind of cool because you you have your newsletter that you send out, which is cash flow air. Right, which you focus on all sorts of different strategies around that stuff, which is cool, making people think about those different kind of avenues that you can create, just different income streams for yourself. Well, the one lesson that I learned in the crash is I had a very, I had all these assets and I was a multimillionaire on paper and the crash hit and then I'm no longer a multimillionaire. So that taught me, and I think you guys do the same thing, is that, you know, if, if you make your focus wealth, you, you could potentially find yourself in a bad spot because you can't control wealth and you can't eat your wealth unless you sell the asset. So after the crash, I was like, okay, I'm going to get back on the horse, but I'm only going to focus specifically on cash flow. And if whatever, whatever appreciation happens, it's just going to be a bonus. And um, so that metric then, I, I'm, a, I'm a much better investor now because I'm not distracted by trying to get wealth, paper wealth. The cash flow gives you freedom because you can 
quit your job, you you know you can pay your bills, you can put food on the table. Where wealth, it's trapped, it's locked. It's it's so funny you say that because after our family went through the real estate crash of 1990, we thought all about cash flow too. That's why we've been so hard with the cash flow message because we knew cash flow was all uh, was uh, what it's all about. It's an important message. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, Rob, there's something that just escaped me about your cash flow. Narrative. Yeah, you said something. I, I I try to tell my kids that one of the most important freedom things that I've ever learned about in life has been the ability to be a good marketer. If you, if I want to pass anything on to my kids, it's not even so much about money. It's like if you understand marketing and the ability to get a customer in the door of a business, you have pure freedom because you can drop. I feel like you can drop me down anywhere in, the, in Chicago, Preston with you, Cleveland with you, Rob. Uh, we can go to Croatia anywhere and I know how to get customers to come through the door and that to me is the ultimate freedom because I can create cash flow from almost thin Anything, air yeah. with that ability and that's part of what I want to kind of share with my kids like that marketing message but I think sometimes people roll their eyes at me like oh my god you're gonna talk about marketing but I feel like it's one of the best life lessons I can share is that how to understand business from a marketing point of view and that might sound a little ridiculous. No, but I mean, if, if you marketing is the most valuable skill you could ever develop, bar, bar none. Yeah, you feel the same way. Oh, bar none. It's yeah. it, you can almost solve any problem in life through marketing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. You shared something in one of your emails. I know we're going to wrap this up. Is that uh, the uh, Zig Ziglar quote of what, how does it go? You can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. Yeah, doesn't that sum it all up? It does. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that before. I, I don't think I was. A number of years ago, I think if you told me that, I, I, I'd be like, eh, I don't know if I really kind of agree with that. You know, I always thought there had to be a winner and a loser type, you know, that type of mindset. But I, I was... I was like now, based on my experience, clearly wrong. But also, if you help people get what they want, you just have such a, pur a sense of purpose in life. It's not empty. It's there's not just, like you're just doing things for money. It's like, okay, I have a purpose. I know what I'm doing yeah, here. Yeah, but there's just more than enough opportunity for everyone, right? It's yeah, like it's like with us, with our investors. Some people come in, they're like, I don't get it. Why would you ever do this and help these, you know, all these, help us as investors? Why don't you just take all these properties for themselves? And you guys know, they're like, look, there's so many opportunities. Right. Like, I can't, like, there's no way I can actually do all this, right? And you guys are seeing it even even in the states when you have these big kind of corporate entities coming in buying tens of thousands of homes. There's still opportunity for everyone. Like it's just there's, oh, there's endless, right? It's kind of crazy. Well, I mean, you can try to go for the money, or you can try to go for the email that you guys share with us this morning. Hey, you guys changed my life. Like, what's more important, you know, mm -hmm. that email or the money that will be gone like that? So. Yeah, no, Zig's quote, I mean, if you study it and you think about, look at every successful person you know, you'll probably find Zig's quote or the, his philosophy operating in their life. You think so? Yeah. Somewhere. I, I, before we wrap this up, I just want quick opinions on university for your children. Well, how are you guys feeling about that? Like, is university mandatory for your children? I'm just curious. Because my, my kids are both on that path to go finish school and go to college or university, right? How, how are you guys feeling about that? Well, for me, I, I took... And I did this with my daughter, so so I took her college fund that we were saving for her, and we together went out and we bought a, a single family home with her college money, and it's her home, and then the rent from that property is going to pay for her college. So I'm I'm trying to show her the strategy of how to use real estate or assets to get what you want in life. But yeah, college is important. Um, you, you don't want to overpay for it, but it's certainly important. Does she get that? Like, do you think we, you've done that and does she, she get it? She yeah. certainly gets it because yeah. she's already planning, you know, because when she graduates, she can live in the house, she can rent it, she can sell it. She, she's already like saying, that's my travel fund. So that's the cool. cash flow from that home will fund her whatever she wants what, to do. What's her, uh, what's she taking in school? She's a f film major. Okay. I just want to disassociate any concept of financial freedom with going to university or college. That's my biggest thing. Whereas I felt I was sold, sold a bill of goods. Like you go to university and your life's going to be great. Well, if you go for it from the perspective, like I want to learn and to become a more well-rounded person and you want that for your children, then yeah, then it makes sense. Totally. But if, if you're in it for just, yeah, it's, you have to look at it differently. I think. Yeah. Cause the, 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 the world changed. It's no longer while well, you go to university and then like your chances of getting a good job are just this much, like so much better. It doesn't really work like that. Cause so many people now, especially like, I mean, all the, the entrepreneurs or business owners we talk to, it's it's they're just looking for good people and what they've gone to school for unless you're looking to be a doctor engineer like very specific skill set a lot of the things are like yeah i don't really actually care what you've gone to school for right. like are you a good person do you have some discipline like we were talking right. last night or work ethic yeah. and you know and what if maybe what can you learn you know because you can learn so much in other avenues now 
it's kind of changed things. Preston, what are you telling your yeah. kids? You know, I'm, I'm, I, to me, it's it's about growth. Is it's just as much about you know education is important. I mean, we you know c- you know people need to continue to be educated through you know for the rest of their lives. But for me, it's it's about I want my kids to to continue to grow mentally. I want them to persevere because you know depending on where they go, I mean, it should be tough. Uh, they're going to be on their own. They're going to fall down. You know, I want that to happen, but still in a, an environment where there's a safety net for them, where whether it's the school itself, whether it's us, I want that for my kids, and I want I want to see them have to persevere to get through a hard college and, and to go to and take hard classes and, and find a way to balance social life. And, okay, and so you're almost using it as resilience, like absolutely. teaching them how to, how to battle. I think so few people today have, you know, have the, you know, and, and I see it, you know, the most successful people I know have, you know, their perseverance is, you know, is, is just tremendous. And I think that's one of the key traits. We kind of discussed this last night at dinner is that's one of the key traits to success. And, I want my kids to learn that and, and it's not taught and it's, you know, it's, I think it's something that's taught at home, but I, I want to push them into opportunities that's going to force them to do that, whether it's athletics, whether it's, you know, my daughter rides horses and, and she has to be there for certain things and has to persevere through cleaning her horse and just doing a lot of, you know, nasty stuff. And I want that for them. I want them to, to, you know, deal with struggle because, you know, when you get on the other side of that, you know, uh, you know, the real estate crash was a blessing for me. I, on the other side of it, jumped into a new business I never would have gotten into. And, and that struggle and that, you know, that those failures that I had through it, you know, taught me, you know, valuable life lessons and, and, you know, put me where I am today. Have you bought a horse yet for your daughter? No, we lease a horse. Okay. We don't buy. Because my daughter's into horseback riding yeah. as well. So I'm yeah. just wondering what's coming down the pipe. My just daughter leasing. rides too. I owned a horse for one week. Oh, did you? <laughs> and then you, it, it ate enough it of your money? I paid for the horse and then I realized and my daughter wasn't taking care of it. And I gave it I gave it away. So it was a very expensive. <laughs> In one week? <laughs> one didn't week. give her even a chance. I cut my losses so fast. <laughs> Yeah. I um you know what it's it's funny you said that just about um them persevering through stuff so my daughter got uh I guess a couple months ago now she got bucked she was, she was doing it for about 6 months uh, the wind came, it seems like the wind came through. The instructor couldn't really figure out exactly what happened, but the, the horse bucked her off. She's eight. She went over the horse head first, did a flip in the air. Like I was watching this and I never, you, like you just don't want to see your kid tossed around like a rag doll. She flipped over, landed kind of partly on her head, partly on her shoulder. Luckily there was no head injury, but she broke her collarbone. Um, and uh, she, she was in rough shape. She she handled it really well to the point where she debated getting on and just walking around with the horse again. They took her around because they wanted to get back on the horse, which I can understand. But uh, as soon as she was better, you know what? She was back. Um, she was a little bit hesitant to take the lesson, but she hopped back on the horse and started going again in and, and, and a much more calm manner and things like she that. But, lesson, but yeah, I think the lesson, there, there was a like, value to going through that. Now, I'd never want to see her break a bone. And, and Jesus, that, that could have been a very serious injury to the way she fell. Like I don't even want to witness something like that again, but after all, all said and done, there is a valuable lesson there in, in the perseverance and realizing that like, yeah, you got to fall down. You got to get your ass back up. You know, hey, I want to, I, I want to wrap this up with uh, the real estate stuff that you guys went through. What would you tell someone who's hesitant to get into real estate today because they think the real estate market's going to crash tomorrow? I will. I, no one will believe this. And I think Preston just said it, but the real estate crash was the best thing that ever happened to me. By not, by, I, I, it completely changed my thought process. I, I went from paper wealth to cash flow, you know, and then I did many strategic defaults on properties because once you do one and your credit's blown, there's no reason not to do more. So once you kind of flip that switch, you, you can move forward with various strategic defaults. But, uh, and then, you know, when your credit score is shot, it's so valuable because now you have to learn to do things without borrowing. And, uh, it was very, it was very helpful for me. So I'm thankful for it, to be honest. Yeah. So you have to get creative on that kind yeah, of environment yeah. when you don't you have, have to become credit. a much better investor. And I guess the long term perspective that you've talked about, you now have yeah. a long term perspective. Preston, what about you yourself? For someone who's thinking of getting in, but they're like, oh, I'm scared. I, I, my big thing is, is I, I truly believe that there's there's two ways to, and there are really only two ways to 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 grow wealth and cash flow in in this world, and that's uh, owning a business or owning real estate. And, you know, you, you have to do, you know, in a perfect world, you can do both, but you have to do at least one. And uh, to me, it's it's you can't predict the future, but, you know, you, you can go in, you know, smartly and invest, you know, invest, you know, and invest with a smart strategy. And if you're investing for cash flow, you're right. And you've got a long term perspective. You're going to be OK. 
you know, all of our, you know, I was able to get through a lot of properties by just saying, look, we're just going to keep fighting and, and yeah, it's going to kind of stink. But, um, at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. I mean, it was the best thing for me. I so much better an entrepreneur. Now I built a business that I never would have done. That was really hard. Um, but it made me, you know, it made me a better investor. It made me a better business person. Um, uh, a better father, a better parent, you know, all the things, uh, because I, you know, I went through some incredibly valuable lessons. I fell, I persevered through it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then what it's done for my confidence just going forward in, in life and business has been incredible. Adver- adversity makes you stronger. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny. I feel like you guys went through a lot to hear you guys come out both with positive messages from it. That's uh that's a big deal. Uh, Preston, we're going to tag you on this podcast. Um, so if ever anyone wants to find Preston, obviously on Instagram. Oh, Instagram. Everywhere. Instagram absolutely. I'm on Instagram <laughs> all the time. All the time. Preston, if you want to sell socks, Rob, apparently just put ads towards Preston on Instagram. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, and then Rob, you're Sorry, not. Sorry, man. No, you're not going right. to that one yeah, down. Yeah, take, okay, take it back. We'll edit. We'll edit. <laughs> you're not on social media. So if someone was going to find the Cashflow and Air program or you are route, is there something you can hand out? Uh, yeah, just come to my site. There's plenty of stuff for you. A book. I, I have a book you can get. But, uh, Which URL? Cashflowandair.com. Okay, we'll link to that as well. So if you're or listening, or just go to, to Cleveland and start asking around. Hey, have you heard of this Rob? <laughs> have you heard of a guy, guy who buys manufactured them? homes and apparently he buys one a month? I'm yeah. sure they're going to be able to find him. So if you're listening to this and you want links, they will be at rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash podcast. You can find this episode and we will link out to that. Guys, thank you for doing this. Really appreciate you sharing the story and coming down and visiting in the whole bit. We've learned so much from both of you guys. So really, really appreciate. Thank you. It. My thank pleasure. You. Hey everyone, so hopefully you enjoyed that chat. We did get go all over the place. Um, I think there's a lot of gems in there in a number of different ways. And if you are listening to this and you want some real estate specific information for Canadians in the greater Toronto, Southern Ontario area, you can get access to all the stuff we're putting out at rockstarinnercircle.com. That's rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it this for this time. Until next time, your life, your terms.